Good afternoon or good morning from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series that is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. The NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation and it aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. I do have the pleasure of announcing our speakers for today's webinar. Uh, we have three um, folks with us today that worked on, on the project uh, and two will be presenting, both Gretchen Hansen and Dan Eiserman. And then Steve Carpenter is also on the line uh, for questions. So I'm just going to introduce all three uh, right up here at the front of the webinar, and then we'll get started. So Gretchen Hansen is a research scientist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, where she studies long-term changes in lake communities. She has a master's degree from Michigan State University and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Gretchen currently lives in Madison with her husband and her two daughters. Dan Eiserman is the leader of the Wisconsin Cooperative Fishery Research Unit and director of the Fisheries Analysis Center at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Stevens Point. Dan's research attempts to address fisheries management issues within the state and the region, with a specific focus on the population dynamics of walleyes and black bass. Steve Carpenter, Carpenter serves as the director of the Center of Monology and the University, excuse me, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison where he is the Stephen Alfred Forbes Professor of Zoology. Steve, Gretchen, and Dan have been working together on Wisconsin walleye, walleye problems for the past four years. So I'd like to welcome all three of our speakers and turn it over to Gretchen. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I hope my mute's off now. Uh, so this is Gretchen Hansen. Um, I will be speaking first today and I'll hand it over to Dan Eiserman for a little bit and then I will wrap it up and then all three of us will take questions. So thanks everybody for joining us today. It's um, exciting for me to be able to talk about the kind of culmination of four years of research that we've been working on here in Wisconsin. And since it's a webinar and it's a little weird that you can't see us, um, I thought I would put our pictures up here so you know who you're dealing with. Uh, so there we are on your screen. I need to figure out how to work this. Okay. And I uh, should also upfront acknowledge that this project was funded by the USGS uh, Climate Change Science Center as well as Sport Fish Restoration Funds to the University uh, or to the Wisconsin DNR. So I want to acknowledge that up front and also acknowledge that this, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, work that has come together from the hard work of a number of people. So we have this sort of bass walleye group that we call ourselves that have been working for the past four years on this research and we've really taken a collaborative approach and a multifaceted approach to do a lot of different kinds of research and I'm, that I'm going to talk about today. So I just want to thank all these people for their involvement in, in this project over the years. Okay, so I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background of how we got started on this project. So in the um, early to mid-2000s here in Wisconsin, there were a lot of anecdotal reports coming in to the Wisconsin DNR on a lake-by-lake -lake basis, mainly, of declines in walleye populations and largemouth bass population increases. And I should point out right now, I'm going to talk a lot today about bass, and I might just say bass. For the most part, I'm referring to largemouth bass. Um, we do have smallmouth bass also in Wisconsin, but our data are not as good on smallmouth. Uh, we don't see the same level of trends, so I'm just not really going to talk about smallmouth today. So when I say bass, I mean largemouth for the purposes of this talk. So anyway, in the early to mid-2000s, there were a lot of anecdotal reports of declines in walleye and increases in largemouth bass. And this is concerning. Uh, to managers in the state of Wisconsin. Walleye are the most targeted sport fish species in the state, so anything um, that leads to walleye declines is concerning. And there was some 
belief um, among some people in the state that because these two trends were happening concurrently, that possibly they were directly related, that large lung mass increases were the cause of walleye declines. And so there was some motivation uh, both within the DNR and then among uh, people at universities to try to investigate this, to try to understand a little bit more about the, the magnitude, the extent, and the cause of these changes. And I should note that there were similar anecdotes coming in from around the region as well. It, it, it seemed like this wasn't necessarily just a Wisconsin problem. So in Minnesota, Michigan, and Ontario, um, there was some inkling that similar trends might be going on. So as these reports were coming in, there have been some management responses in Wisconsin to these declines in walleye and increases in bass. So one of the major ones has been uh, what's known as the Wisconsin Walleye Initiative. So $12 million were devoted uh, to stocking more walleye, specifically to stocking extended growth fingerling walleye, so larger walleye than what are normally stocked. So that was a, uh, one response to declining walleye populations. At the same time, there have been some um, restrictions on harvest, including closure of a very prominent fishery in Wisconsin to walleye harvest just recently. So, Certainly management is responding to uh, these declines in walleye, even when the causes might be unknown. At the same time, there has been a liberalization of bass regulations to try to encourage more harvest of bass, um, including some kind of localized, interesting um, fishing tournament events to sort of promote the idea that harvesting and cooking and eating bass is something that maybe the public should, should get interested in. So all of this management response, um, while this is going on, we still have a lot of questions about what the causes are, what's going on and causing these trends in, in these two species. So like I said, there's some idea that possibly the increases in bass and declines in walleye were directly related. But as you can imagine, there are a number of other factors that we could hypothesize might be causing changes in these fish species. And in fact, um, all of these factors may interact in a very complex web um, of interactions influencing bass and walleye individually, as well as the way that they might interact with each other. And so as we started this research project, it became clear that no single approach to understanding the system was likely to work, and that we needed to take a, a collaborative and multifaceted approach to start to disentangle this web. So that's what we did, and I'm going to organize my talk today talking about three major areas, uh, kind of broad areas of research that we've done over the past four years. So the first thing we wanted to do was to really just quantify the magnitude and the extent of these patterns and trends in bass and walleye. So try to understand how severe is the problem of walleye declines, how widespread is the problem, and the same questions for for bass increases, how, how much have bass increased, and, and how widespread is, are those trends. After we, had, we um, kind of nailed down the magnitude of the problem, we then spent a lot of time generating and evaluating hypotheses about what might be causing them. So uh, something I'm going to talk a lot about today is water temperature and how that might be related to these trends. Uh, we also tried to identify other factors we thought might be associated with the trends and also identify knowledge gaps in areas where we needed to design some new studies and new research um, to get into some of the mechanisms of what might be going on. So at the end of the talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on some of the ongoing and future research, and, and Dan, Dr. Eisman will talk about that as well. And then finally, these first two areas of research are certainly uh, related to management, but we also spent some time focusing on research that was really directly management oriented. So really evaluating the role of harvest as a management tool for largemouth bass to try to understand could increased angler harvest um, even control bass populations in Wisconsin. We have started an adaptive management study to try to evaluate our management responses in the field. So I'll talk a little bit about that and also develop some models for prediction and prioritization of locations to try to um, maximize the success of our management actions by targeting them to places where we think they actually will work. So I'll talk briefly about that as well. 
So let's start at the beginning, identifying patterns and trends. This seemed like an important first step to this project. So like I said, when we started, uh, we had some anecdotal reports on an individual lake basis of declines in walleye. And when we dug into all the data we had, we found indeed um, that statewide walleye recruitment to age zero was declining. So I want to note, I'm going to talk a lot about re walleye recruitment today. And in all cases, I'm talking about recruitment to age zero. So basically, survival of young walleye to the first fall. And I know that um, other states might define recruitment differently. And Certainly, recruitment to age zero is not the same as recruitment to the fishery, but because we're seeing these strong declines in recruitment to age zero, where walleye in many places in Wisconsin are not surviving past their first summer, um, if they can't make it past their first summer, they certainly can't make it to be a six or 10 or 20 year old walleye that can be harvested. So, so we're focusing a lot on why aren't they making it through that first summer. So what we found when we looked uh, statewide was an average decline in recruitment of about 6.6% per year. This is statewide average numbers since 1989. So that was pretty concerning. But obviously, the statewide average doesn't tell the whole story. We have um, tens of thousands of lakes in Wisconsin. And so looking at individual lake trends was also important. So when we looked at lakes where we had enough data over the past three decades to try to identify a trend, we found a similar story, that in fact, um, the majority of lakes where we had data, walleye recruitment was declining. So this histogram here in the upper left corner shows annual percent change on the x-axis. So that's basically the slope of the line on the log scale of walleye recruitment over time. And then the percentage of lakes that showed that trend. And the red dashed line is, is the zero line. So everything to the left of zero means walleye recruitment in those lakes was declining. And anything up here in the positive range means recruitment was actually increasing since 1989. So the, we, there are a substantial number of lakes where we do see increases, but the vast majority uh, we see declines. And those trends are plotted here on the map, color coded. Uh, with the blue colors showing declines and the green sh showing increases. And what was interesting to note early on was that there was a large degree of spatial heterogeneity. So we could have lakes right next door to each other where um, you might see strong declines in recruitment in one lake and then increases in recruitment in another. So that spatial heterogeneity told us that this wasn't just a regional um, trend that was operating the same in every lake, that there, there were some complexities that we needed to understand to know why these lakes were responding differently. So that's walleye recruitment. When we looked at adult walleye, uh, we saw also the statewide average um, adult walleye densities were also declining since 1989, but the rate of decline was not as large. Um, average decline of about 2% per year in this case. And that makes sense because adult walleye numbers are really influenced by a large number of things besides recruitment. We do a lot of stocking in Wisconsin, as is the case in many places. Um, and harvest pressure can also influence adult populations. So it, it makes sense that the declines would not be as strong. But, but we did see declines in adult density as well. And again, when we look on a lake-specific basis, we once again see some heterogeneity, with some lakes showing increases in adult walleye density but the majority having decreases. When we looked at largemouth bass, we saw, for the most part, increases in largemouth bass throughout the state. The average, the statewide average uh, uh, rate of increase was about 4% per year. And the, in this case, the majority of lake uh, bass were increasing. And then a small number, we, we saw some decreases. And again, some spatial heterogeneity throughout the state. So when we tried to look at concurrent trends between largemouth bass and walleye, uh, we found we had a, not a huge number of lakes where we had the um, ability to quantify trends in both species. Um, about 30 lakes where we had data for both species that we could look at um, 
the concurrent trends. So what you see here is a by plot on the x-axis is the largemouth bass trend. So anything over zero means largemouth bass are increasing. On the y-axis, we have the walleye trend. This is walleye recruitment in this case. And um, anything below this zero line would be walleye are decreasing. And perhaps not surprisingly, given the trends in the um, species individually, we see in most cases where we have data for both, largemouth bass are increasing and walleye are decreasing in this quadrant here. But because largemouth bass themselves are most of the time increasing and walleye are most of the time decreasing, um, we wanted to test whether the uh, co-occurrence of these trends was happening more often than you would expect by chance. And the result uh, was somewhat equivocal, uh, a p-value of 0 0.06 uh, when we do a, a chi-squared test here. So I would say uh, there's some moderate, maybe possibly evidence that these trends are happening at the same time more often than you would expect by chance, uh, but certainly not, nothing really conclusive came out of this. And I think it's important to remember uh, the lesson that all of us have heard, you know, probably hundreds of times, but sometimes it's easy to forget, that correlation doesn't equal causation, right? So we, we can see that, yeah, in a lot of lakes, bass are increasing, walleye are decreasing. But this doesn't really tell us much about the mechanism of what might be causing these things. Uh, so I'd like to show slides uh, from this great website where it's called Spurious Correlations, where you can find any number of interesting correlations. This is my personal favorite. So in the U.S., per capita cheese consumption correlates quite well with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. So this has an R squared of 0.9. Um, I think most of us would be pretty excited to get R squareds of 0.9 in our analyses. Um, and maybe you could come up with some uh, post hoc explanation of why these two things might be related, but I think all of us can agree that this is a spurious correlation. And so I'd just like to put this up as a as a reminder that just because we see these trends happening at the same time, it doesn't mean that they're actually directly related. And uh, a big part of our job as researchers here is to dig a little bit deeper and try to understand um, what might be the mechanism. So that was the next step in our uh, research approach was to, as I said, dig a little deeper, look into uh, what else might be changing at the same time in these lakes that we know could potentially be associated with these two species and then to design some, some new projects to gather some new data to try to understand more about mechanism. So a lot of what I have been working on is focused on water temperature and the potential role of water temperature in driving trends in, in uh, fish species in lakes in Wisconsin. So temperature can be thought of as a master factor in ecology. It controls the rates of pretty much every process that we might care about from nutrient cycling to uh, oxygen concentration, algal dynamics, zooplankton dynamics, and of course fish. Uh, temperature controls the distribution, growth, survival, reproduction, kind of every major rate of fish population. So it's very important. And we wanted to evaluate how temperature might be related to the trends that we have seen in bass and walleye in Wisconsin. And for those of you who are not uh, lake people, I, I thought I'd just take a minute to talk about water temperature in lakes because if you want to know something about what is the water temperature of this lake, it's not a matter of just knowing a single number. Uh, water temperature in lakes, the kind of lakes that we're most interested uh, for the most part in Wisconsin, is heterogeneous. So most of the lakes that we're dealing with that um, have bass and walleye in them stratify in the summer, meaning that um, the water segregates based on temperature with warm water in the upper region of the lake, known as the epilimnion, and cold water in the deeper waters, known as the hypolimnion. And those layers don't really mix um, because of the density differences in water. They're really separated from each other for most of the summer. And this is important from a fisheries perspective because fish species have distinct temperature preferences. So largemouth bass are warm water fish that are most likely going to prefer the upper waters of a lake, whereas walleye are cool water fish, um, probably more likely to be found in sort of the middle area of a lake where the water is a bit cooler than you would find at the surface. 
So in trying to understand the role of temperature and explaining the trends that we saw, it seemed like it was important to understand temperature for on a whole lake basis um, for our lakes in Wisconsin. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data on water temperature in lakes, particularly over the time scale that we were interested in, so the past three decades, um, at the resolution that we might care about, so knowing something about temperature over the whole course of the season, um, and certainly not for knowing temperature across the entire profile um, or depth range of a lake. We just don't have that kind of data for the most lakes in Wisconsin, or really in the world, I would say. Um, so the approach that we have taken is to model temperatures from known conditions and try to hindcast what we think temperatures, water temperatures in lakes were likely to have been in the past um, using a mechanistic thermodynamic model. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the details of this model. Um, you can find those details in this paper listed here or contact me or um, Jordan Reed or my other co-authors here later and we'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I will just say that this model uses um, air temperature and solar radiation and wind information from past days where we have that information uh, combined with lake-specific characteristics like clarity, uh, so water clarity, and canopy cover, which influences how wind will affect the lake. And um, then, like I said, uses a thermodynamic model to hindcast daily temperature profiles of lakes. So the output of this model is depth-specific daily temperature values, and we did this for about 2,400 lakes uh, from 1979 through 2012 in Wisconsin. And so this heat map shows an example of um, the data you'd get for one lake uh, for one open water season with warmer water at the top in the warm colors, cold water at the bottom in the cool colors. So imagine we have this level of data for 2,400 lakes for 30 plus years. So we, and the model works quite well to hindcast water temperatures, and we were pretty happy with the results. Um, but we wanted to distill this vast amount of data into metrics that were um, biologically relevant for the species that we were interested in. So for example, so instead of using um, you know, daily temperature profiles, we would calculate metrics such as growing degree days, uh, which is basically a measure of the cumulative water temperature in a lake, and um, as well as a large number of other um, temperature outputs. And these are the kind of metrics that we then uh, tried to associate with fish populations to see if temperature could explain the trends that we were seeing. But as a kind of a side note, one thing that we found was that water temperatures were quite variable across Wisconsin. So when we look at this map of growing degree days, on this scale, it's probably not surprising that you see uh, lakes in the southern part of the state are more red, meaning higher growing degree days, meaning warmer water. So warmer water, higher growing degree days in the south compared to the north, that's probably not very surprising. But if you drill in and zoom in a little bit closer, and I should note that this, the color scale here has changed, um, but it still represents a, a fairly large difference in growing degree days. When we zoom in close like this, you can see that lakes right next to each other can have very different temperature regimes. So like if we circle this little group of three lakes here, um, three lakes almost right on top of each other that span a range of about 500 growing degree days. Um, and they're quite different. So seeing this kind of small scale heterogeneity in water temperatures was interesting given that we saw small scale heterogeneity in um, walleye trends as well. So uh, this was encouraging as we started our temperature modeling. So the next step was then to um, more formally try to relate water temperature metrics that we thought might be related to walleye and to bass to the uh, walleye and bass populations that we had data for across the state. The way that we did that 
was using a statistical model known as a random forest model. And again, I'm not going to get too deep into the details of this kind of modeling. Um, I'm happy to talk about it later with anybody who's interested. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I will say it is a tree-based uh, method that um, classifies data. Uh, in our case, what I'm showing here is probability of walleye recruitment success. So in this case, just a yes or no, did recruitment happen or did it not happen? Um, so the random forest, you can, it will look at a large number of predictor variables and identify relationships between those predictor variables and recruitment success. And the random forest is a great method for our purposes because it can identify nonlinear relationships as well as interactions, um, which can be really important in, in complex systems like this. And um, so what I'm going to show you here is just the relationship between a single variable and probability of recruitment success for the variables that we selected um, using a model selection technique as the uh, best predictors of walleye recruitment. And in random forest, the effects of one variable often depend on the levels of another variable or of all the other variables. So what I'm going to show in these figures is the um, is the median effect of the variable of interest. So in this case, lake area is what I'm showing. So the black line is the median effect, and then the kind of gray bars is the interquartile range, given all the other va values of the other variables. So what we see for walleye recruitment, this first most important variable was lake area. So we see uh, lakes with larger surface areas have a higher probability of walleye recruitment. And there were four other variables that came out as important in predicting water recruitment success. Uh, three of those were related to water temperature. So we have the coefficient of variation of surface water temperatures, um, both 30 to 60 days post ice off and 0 to 30 days post ice off. So basically, variability in water temperatures um, as walleye are spawning, as walleye are in their egg stage, and then immediately um, following swim up when they're, when they're fry and, and larval stage. So that's these two CV metrics. And then growing degree days, which I talked about before, which is the cumulative measure of water temperature in a year. So here we see uh, lower growing degree days means cooler water. Walleye recruitment is more likely when degree days are lower, less likely in warmer water when degree days are higher. And for the variability metrics, while recruitment is more likely in both, ca both cases when variability is lower in the spring water temperatures. So like I said, this random forest technique can also identify interactions between variables. So the effect of one predictor, say growing degree days, may depend on the level of another predictor. Um, in this case, the variability of water temperatures in that 30 to 60 days after ice goes off of a lake. So what I'm showing you here is a contour plot uh, where the darker purple colors represent higher probability of walleye recruitment and the lighter kind of pale blue represent lower probability of walleye recruitment. So here we see there is this kind of sweet spot uh, for walleye recruitment where degree days are less than about you know, 24, 2500, and variability of uh, water temperatures is are below uh, around 0.17. So in that kind of sweet spot, walleye recruitment is likely to be, um, well, is more likely, and outside of that in any direction, um, the probability of walleye recruitment goes down. But because of some of the interactions, you can see um, a little bit darker colors in this region and this region than out here in the corner. So uh, for example, you can still have a decent probability of walleye recruitment even with high degree days as long as your CV of water temperatures is low. And conversely, you can still have a decent probability of walleye recruitment at high levels of variability as long as your degree days are low. So these kind of contour plots help us to identify interactions and, and what kinds of conditions are most conducive to walleye recruitment. 
And what was interesting to see, um, what we then did, was to look at how our walleye lakes in Wisconsin have changed over time in terms of these temperature variables. So that's what I'm showing here. And this plots the path of the median of all Wisconsin walleye lakes in terms of these two water temperature variables. So we see um, a movement from this kind of sweet spot purple zone out into the not so good blue zone. Um, so over time, we're moving away from places where recruitment is most likely. We did the same thing for bass. So um, the same technique to try to predict bass abundance from variables we thought might be important. And again, we see, um, in this case, only one temperature variable came out as important, and it was degree days once again. Um, so, but in this case, the relationship was opposite. So largemouth bass abundance was predicted to be highest uh, when degree days were higher, so in warmer waters. Um, and then some other variables related to lake morphometry and landscape position were also important. And I thought it was interesting to plot the um, effects of degree days for both species side by side. So we can see um, that they actually look like almost mirror images of each other uh, with a threshold at around 24, 2500 degree days um, separating uh, high probability of walleye recruitment from low and high probability of there being a lot of bass from low. And we found in both cases that the temperature effect was strongest in small lakes. So the effect of growing degree days uh, was much higher um, in lakes of, say, 100 hectares, shown here for both species with the black line, uh, than in bigger lakes, say, of 1,000 hectares, shown in the blue line. Um, so it was just interesting to find, using totally independent data sets, we found uh, really similar results for both walleye and for bass. Um, suggesting that maybe they're both responding to, um, to temperature in some of these lakes. But again, I have to go back to my favorite slide. Um, we can do this uh, kind of high-level statistical modeling that provides some really great information of the types of conditions that are most associated with good walleye recruitment or high bass abundance. But again, we're still working really with correlations. And it's, we don't know the mechanism in this case. So, when growing degree days get hot, gets high, it's not like it's necessarily too warm for walleye to live. Um, so there's some kind of complex interaction going on there um, that we needed to drill a little deeper to understand the mechanism. Um, so that's where um, my colleague, Dr. Eiserman, will talk now. All right. So. As Gretchen mentioned early in her presentation um, with some of the slides, the interactions within these ecosystems can be pretty complex, but when we think about the relationship between bass and walleye, there are two rather obvious mechanisms that come to most people's mind that could cause that to occur, and that would be direct predation by bass on young walleye and then competition for available prey. Uh, so to assess the extent of those mechanisms, we went out and collected diets from hundreds of largemouth bass and walleyes from four northern Wisconsin lakes with various combinations of walleye and largemouth bass abundance. And we did this from May to October, and for brevity's sake, I'm showing you summarized data here. Uh, we also used DNA barcoding to help us reduce error associated with partially digested diet items. Uh, what we found is that largemouth bass rarely consumed walleyes. We saw one incident of this in 945 largemouth bass diets, so fairly rare. Um, and this was true even when relatively strong year classes of age zero walleyes were present. Um, walleyes and bass shared a wide variety of prey items. The top five are, are summarized here. Um, and as you can see, the two species where we saw the highest level of niche overlap or groups of species here with sunfish and then yellow perch. And of course, our findings don't allow us to declare that competition is occurring uh, because these resources would have to be limiting, but at least gives us an idea that these are the two groups where the highest potential for competition might be. As Gretchen also demonstrated that there's been these landscape level changes probably in temperature regimes that have provided for increased bass recruitment over the last decade or more. 
And many previous studies have suggested that the growth of bass and the length that they attain in their first year of life can influence recruitment through size selective mortality processes and that these factors can be influenced by hatch timing. But there's very limited information on this for largemouth bass in northern lakes. Uh, so what we did is went out to seven lakes across the state of Wisconsin. We've been doing this over the last four years. We've collected age zero largemouth bass of approximately this size. And then we've removed their otoliths so that we can use the daily rings pictured here to estimate their hatch dates. And so we're collecting these bass at the end of July, early August, and, and counting their daily rings and their otoliths to see are we seeing trends in hatch date that could lead maybe to increased size and eventual recruitment. Um, I'm going to show you two years here. 2012 was the first year we did this. Uh, this was the year in the upper Midwest where we had some 80 degree water temperatures at the end of March, so fairly early ice out, even early April. Um, and then in 2013, uh, this was a year where people were ice fishing in some places on the walleye opener. So, so two very stark years in terms of temperature regimes. And you can see that the median hatch date in 2012 was much earlier um, than the median hatch date in 2013, although we didn't really see any major differences in hatching duration, which is depicted in this other graph here. Now, the important part about this is whether it equated to anything in terms of the size of the bass at the end of summer. And certainly when we look at early hatched fish, middle and late hatched fish, in 2012 we do see a trend that these early hatched fish were slightly larger, but the differences are pretty minor. We're talking on the order of three to six millimeters. And then in 2013 with the late ice out, we did not really observe any, uh, or we didn't observe any significant differences in the average size of these fish at the end of their first summer. We've got two more years of data to add to this analysis, so we've continued to collect these fish from these lakes. And then one of the other questions Gretchen hinted at is we know that we're losing these walleyes essentially in the first year of life based on not catching them in age zero electrofishing surveys. So one of the primary questions is when exactly in their development are we losing them? And then these lakes that have different recruitment histories, do we see variation in abiotic and biotic factors such as temperature or water clarity? And so Hadley Bohm, who's one of our current grad students, is working on this project. We selected four lakes in northern Wisconsin, um, two that have a history of sustained walleye natural reproduction, meaning that it continues at a variable rate as would be expected and that's Escanaba and Big Arbor Vita Lakes. And then two lakes where we've seen declining natural reproduction of walleyes uh, to the point that we, we have not observed any walleyes in these systems in a, in a couple of years. And then we essentially went to these systems and, and threw everything but the kitchen sink at them in terms of trying to collect walleyes in their first year of life. Um, this included egg mats, larval towing and light traps, staining, micro mesh gill nets, and then our typical age zero electrofishing that occurs at the end of each summer in the early fall. Um, and this allowed us to develop a call for assessing walleyes in these lakes, which includes larval towing at night in late May, these micro mesh gill nets in, in mid July to late July, and then the typical age zero electrofishing uh, to sample them at the end of the summer. And what we also found is that in these lakes where we're seeing sustained natural reproduction, we always encountered adults, we always captured eggs on the egg mats, and we observed both larvae and juveniles in both years. But on the declining NR lakes, uh, there were some adults still present, and we did collect relatively low numbers of eggs in both years, but we never encountered a larval walleye or a juvenile fish in age zero electrofishing. So this makes us think that the bottleneck is probably at the larval stage or earlier, and we're still processing zooplankton samples, so the differences in, in these lakes um, in terms of temperature, water clarity, and zooplankton are yet to be determined. 
However, we do know the two declining NR lakes are generally clearer than our two sustaining um, natural reproducing systems. And so with that, I think Gretchen's going to take back over here. I think it's still you, Dan, for a couple more slides. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I guess next we're going to talk about this uh, next phase of the project, uh, which is these management actions. And, of course, one of the things Gretchen mentioned is that the DNR has liberalized bass harvest regulations on some systems and in some locations to try to potentially alleviate any effects that might occur between the two species. And then additionally, just for the sake of bass management, increasing abundance does pose some problems in terms of density-dependent growth and maybe our ability to provide quality size fish for anglers. Um, so on the four lakes where we did the diet work, we also wanted to simulate uh, what if, what would the with what effects do fishing mortality have on bass abundance, and what would it actually take to reduce bass abundance? Um, and this is in light of the fact that most anglers release most of the bass they catch. Um, so at best guess, we're talking about exploitation rates that are probably on an annual level five percent or less. So on these systems, we collected a variety of data that included mark recapture population estimates, otolith-based estimates of fishing mortality um, and growth trajectories. We developed some stock recruit relationships and then put these in to age-structured models to simulate the effects of fishing mortality under different harvest regulations that were chosen uh, by the Wisconsin DNR's bass management team. One of the first things we learned is that bass in these northern lakes can live a really long time. This is the oldest fish that we captured in the study. Uh, so you'll see 21 annuli here, or at least I see 21, and then if you add a year, you get a 22-year-old fish. But they regularly live beyond 10 years of age, um, and that means that a strong year class can persist for a very long time and influence abundance estimates well into the future. And a lot of these really large fish, uh, say fish over 18 inches long that anglers really want to catch, they're generally over 15 years old, so it's taking them quite a while to get to those larger sizes. And when we look at the results of our simulations, I'm just going to show you one lake here so you can get sort of a feel for this. Um, these white dots, and it looks like I love, these white dots here represent a 25% reduction in initial abundance. And you can see, regardless of the harvest regulation, they require a pretty substantial amount of fishing mortality relative to what we're seeing on the landscape now. And then in terms of reducing abundance while still maintaining size structure to some level, uh, these, these two middle harvest regulations probably offered the best case scenario. Certainly a no minimum length limit was the best option and required the lowest amount of fishing mortality to get the 25% reduction in abundance, but a substantial increase in, in fishing mortality would be needed for this to really work effectively. All right, now, now I'm going to pass it on to Gretchen. Okay, thanks, Dan. So I'm just going to wrap up with a, a couple more um, mostly um, ongoing and future, future projects a little pointer back. So I mentioned in the beginning we have initiated an adaptive management experiment in collaboration with uh, many of our biologists throughout the state who have been willing to uh, work with us to try to understand what's going on out there in the landscape. So as I said in the beginning, uh, this whole research project started because there were a lot of reports coming in of lake-specific uh, declines in walleye and increases in bass. And there were a lot of uh, places where the stakeholders and uh, the biologists wanted regulations to be changed in order to try to reverse those trends. And so we designed an adaptive management experiment to try to do these regulation changes in a way that will allow us to learn if they work or if they don't. Uh, so what we've done is we have 20 experimental lakes and uh, 10 reference lakes where 
sorry, let's start with the experimental. So we have 20 experimental lakes where we've seen these declines in walleye and increases in bass, uh, where the regulations have been changed in three important ways. So first, um, increased stocking of those extended growth large walleye fingerlings is going on. Also, more, restriction, more restrictions on walleye harvest to try to protect adult walleye populations. And then a liberalization of largemouth bass regulations to try and encourage more bass harvest. So we're really kind of throwing uh, the three major tools that we might use in the state of Wisconsin to um, try to change the trajectories of sport fish populations. And uh, we're throwing all three at them at once to see if the trends in these lakes can be reversed. And importantly for uh, the prospect of learning, we also have 10 reference lakes. So in these lakes, the same trends have been observed, but we're not doing any of those three uh, regulation changes. So this will allow us to track over time things that we care about, like walleye recruitment, in both the reference and the treatment lakes and see if there's any difference in response in the places where we've done these regulation changes compared to the places where we haven't. So this is ongoing um, and hopefully we'll have some, at least some prelimina preliminary results in the next uh, couple of years. And then um, another thing we're doing is to try to use um, the statistical models that we've developed to help prioritize management actions. So one example of this that's already occurred is uh, we have used the walleye recruitment model that predicts the probability of natural walleye recruitment uh, for really any lake in Wisconsin. Um, and we've used that to help prioritize stocking under the Wisconsin Walleye Initiative. So there were a large number of lakes, several hundred lakes that were proposed for stocking. We ran them through our model to say um, what is the probability that these lakes could support natural recruitment. And places where the probability was high, so conditions seemed good that while a natural recruitment could occur, but it wasn't happening, uh, those were prioritized for stocking with the idea that stocking should be prioritized in places where maybe natural recruitment could be restored. And ongoing work now is to um, take our water temperature model that I described earlier and extend that out into the future. So what I talked about before was hindcast water temperatures and we also have developed uh, forecast water temperatures under various climate models. And in progress now is to use that information to make projections about future fish populations, future walleye recruitment, and hopefully use that information to help prioritize management to um, places where it's most likely to be successful. So identify lakes where we expect um, resilient walleye populations to exist and maybe focus our protection efforts on those lakes and also identify lakes where um, they might not have as great of a chance. So that's ongoing. And so now I'm just going to sum up. Uh, so like I said in the beginning, we kind of separated our project into three major areas of research. We identified patterns and we discovered that uh, walleye adult densities and recruitment have declined over time, while largemouth bass abundance has increased over time, but that in both cases these trends can be somewhat spatially variable, not going in the same direction or the same magnitude uh, in every lake. We have looked at a number of hypotheses and generated some new ones. We found that walleye recruitment is most likely in large cool lakes. Largemouth bass abundance is highest in small warm lakes. We have some evidence that walleye recruitment failure is occurring at the fry stage or potentially even earlier in some lakes. And also we found that adult largemouth bass rarely consume walleye, suggesting that direct predation is not the mechanism operating um, here. We also found that largemouth bass and walleye share prey and have a substantial degree of overlap between their prey resources, but we can't really say if competition is happening or not because we don't know if those resources are limiting. We found that ice out timing influences hatch timing of largemouth bass, uh, but that hatch timing seems to have fairly little influence on the length of those bass at the end of their first summer. And then finally, in terms of management, uh, we have identified that substantial increases in angler harvest are going to be needed in order for angling to reduce largemouth bass abundance because most anglers release most of the bass they catch and because bass are so long-lived and have low mortality. 
Our adaptive management experiment will allow us to evaluate the effectiveness of the regulation changes that have already been implemented. And we hope that the predictive modeling we continue to work on will help to identify locations where management success can be most likely. So that's it. Looks like we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and here's the contact information for both me and Dan. And I should just say I cut off the uh, end of his beautiful pike here in the first picture, so I thought I had to put it on in the last one just to credit. And I had to throw a picture of myself with a fish, too. So uh, I think Ashley will take over to moderate the question asking. Yes. So thank you very much, Gretchen and Dan. Wonderful presentation from Henry. It says, what about northern pike population trends? Um, yeah, so unfortunately, we don't have great data on northern pike populations over time in, in Wisconsin. Um, so we, we do have some research scientists working on that on a kind of smaller scale basis. Um, but I haven't worked much on it, so I can't really say much more, I guess. And I would just say in the course of our diet work, we did, when we encountered pike, um, often look at their diet items, and, and we did not see any walleye predation during the study, although we have seen some predation and additional samples that have come, come through the office. So we certainly know they can be a predator for walleyes, but whether their abundance is up or down is a little more difficult to tease out of our sampling gears. We have another question uh, coming in from Sean, and it says, you said you're planning to increase the harvest of largemouth bass, but elsewhere you said there was no direct uh, predation by largemouth bass on the walleye and little competition for food resources. Just wondering why you think this will help. Yeah, that's a good question, Sean. Um, so one answer is that, um, Dan alluded to this a little bit, that in addition to having concerns about potential uh, direct effects of large amount bass on walleye, uh, there are additional concerns about uh, the increased densities of large amount bass causing changes to their size structure that are not desirable. So that by decreasing densities, um, you can actually improve the uh, largemouth bass fishery in terms of its size structure. So, so that's one answer. Um, another would be that um, some of these regulation changes were put in place before those predation results were obtained. I don't know if Dan has anything more to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the initial changes in the regulations were just a good example of a management agency being proactive in responding to the changes and also we're somewhat experimental as part of a recovery effort. You know, if we make these changes to management on some systems, do we garner a response from the walleyes in the system and then maybe sort out the causative mechanisms later because it does take more time to do that. So I, I think a lot of the, re there hasn't been any, to my knowledge, any more real recent uh, liberalization attempts, a lot of these happened very early in this research where there were, you know, the first thing we saw was just these trends between the two species. We have another question from Patrick, um, and it's, was there any insight gained into the potential effect of zebra mussels on the wa walleye recruitment? So we don't have a, a ton of lakes with zebra mussels in Wisconsin, um, and that wasn't actually something that I looked at in this large-scale analysis. So uh, my, my gut response is zebra mussels are not a major mechanism, but that said, clarity does seem to potentially be a mechanism, so certainly zebra mussels could be an influence, but it's not something that has uh, really been focused on here in Wisconsin. Um, another question comes in on the chat from Rick, and it says, are lakes with dec uh, decreasing recruitment of walleye the same as the lakes with decreasing trends of the walleye adults? Yes, sometimes. So we don't, we don't have as much data on adults. We measure adults doing mark recapture studies in most cases, uh, in, in northern Wisconsin in particular. And those are, um, as you can imagine, pretty resource intensive. So we do um, 
many more recruitment surveys per year than we do adult density surveys. So we don't necessarily have a good time series data on both walleye recruitment and walleye adults in all of the lakes. But yes, uh, in places where we do see declining adults, we generally also see declining recruitment. And usually we see recruitment declining first. Thank you. And from Gregor, it says, have there ever been efforts to establish walleye populations south of their historical range? I mean, I, within, certainly that would be true with, in the state of Wisconsin and across North America, I mean, they've been stocked probably, I'm going to say, in most of the 48 contiguous states. So certainly in southern, southern reservoirs, including places like Tennessee and elsewhere, where they've been stocked outside of their, they may have occurred there, but they've been stocked into systems where did they, they did not previously occur. Yeah, and just a further further comment on that, it says uh, such efforts might be analogous to efforts to retain walleye in the southern parts of their historical range as temperatures warm and so might provide useful information for efforts to resist the effects of warming. I would say that natural recruitment in those southern populations is probably not occurring, in, at least in you know small inland lakes like we're talking about here. So that that is a useful um, system to look at. I have two more questions. Um, one from Daryl and it says, are the efforts of the walleyes for tomorrow aiding walleye reproduction? So w one of the additional studies that we have that's been ongoing is sort of looking at availability of spawning habitat in relation to recruitment. And this I know is something that Gretchen's working towards as well. You know, so a lot of these groups are either stocking or making some effort to improve spawning habitat. And with regards to the spawning habitat end of it, um, we've had one initial study where we looked at 16 lakes in northern Wisconsin and were really unable to find a strong or any strong evidence that the amount and the quality of spawning habitat was really influencing walleye recruitment in those 16 lakes. But that data is really lacking at a large scale because collecting habitat data in the past has been a time consuming task. And so we were working to develop side scan sonar to do the substrate mapping. Thank you. And our last question comes from Heath, and it says, during the past two decades, uh, WDNR has been stocking two-inch walleye and in large numbers in the lakes with declining walleye abundance with limited recruitment success. Any thoughts on why these fish would not survive if the recruitment bottleneck is at the fry stage? I mean, I would say that there could be multiple bottlenecks, and the only one that we're seeing in those two lakes we're working on is that they're just not making it to the fry stage. But so, so we've discussed how to address Heath's question with an additional exercise. So our hope is we're going to expand the work that we have been doing um, and do sampling on more lakes. And then it would be interesting to see if, you know, say possibly you injected fry into a system, do they make it beyond that stage, or, or if two-inch fingerlings are going into a system, are, are they making it beyond that phase as well? Yeah, but that's, that's really the million-dollar question of why, why they're not surviving, and yeah, that's what we're continuing to work on. As Excellent. Thank you. And then did, you, did Dan, Steve, or Gretchen have any just closing remarks? No, just thanks for everybody attending. I was impressed. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your attention and your time.